We are back. We are here. We are ready. Let's dive in. Infinity Ward to step up efforts to crack down on modern warfare racists. And this is some good news for all you Call of Duty players out there. Like myself, you recognize this is much needed as Modern Warfare developer Infinity Ward will be taking more steps to find and ban players using racial slurs in their in-game display names, as well as other measures to keep racist language out of its games. They said this yesterday. Since the launch of Call of Duty Modern Warfare last year, players have been able to input customized names for themselves that display in place of a traditional gamer tag. Many players have reported seeing slurs, such as the N-word, used quite often in these names. And the Call of Duty community got louder about the issue in the wake of publisher Activision Blizzard making statements of support for the ongoing Black Lives Matter protest currently taking place in all 50 states with members of the community, including the news site Modern Warfare, calling on the publisher to put its words into action and scrub its games of the racial slurs that some players use in their handles. Infinity Ward has since responded, quote, there is no place for racist content in our game, says a tweet outlining the efforts being made to clean up Modern Warfare. The developer said it will devote additional resources to monitor and identify racist content, add additional in-game reporting systems, add filters and more restrictions to name changes, and increase the number of permanent bans for repeat offenders. Activision recently made the appropriate decision to postpone the upcoming seasons of content for Modern Warfare. Warzone and Call of Duty Mobile, framing its support specifically with protesters' push for racial justice. Quote, right now, it's time for those speaking up for equality, justice, and change to be seen and heard, reads the official Call of Duty statement. We stand alongside you. And when asked for comment on these statements earlier today by Kotaku, Activision Blizzard did not respond with any specifics about what support actions, supportive actions it is planned to take, the Call of Duty community quickly zeroed in on something it thought the publisher could do, which is to address the issues of racial slurs appearing in Modern Warfare. Instead of having their Xbox gamer tag or PSN ID displayed during a match, Modern Warfare and Warzone accounts are able to input their own custom names. This is made easy due to Modern Warfare's crossplay capabilities, which require players to register an Activision account on the Call of Duty website. And the Activision IDs that are then shown in the game are composed of a hashtag and unique series of numbers. But these can be hidden and anything can be typed in front of the numbers to serve as the player's in-game name, which does not need to be unique as many players can use the same name. Call of Duty news and leak site Modern Warzone has been tweeting efforts using the hashtag, hashtag end COD racism, end COD racism, to elevate the voices looking for Activision to implement a stricter profanity filter. Some players are looking to counter the hate by changing their clan tags to BLM, cleaning house on the abundant use of the N-word and other slurs should be the absolute least Activision Blizzard can do, given its stated support for standing against racism. Hopefully, Infinity War's actions will make Call of Duty statements feel like more than just empty words. I was incredibly excited to see this news. I think it has been long overdue. Just because this movement has happened doesn't mean that, you know, the people haven't always wanted this to happen, haven't always wanted this to change. And this is long overdue, and I'm glad that they're finally doing it. Yeah, uh, couldn't agree more. As one thing that I think many players who play long enough within Call of Duty, there is a little bit of a, of a culture that surrounds the game that more mature-minded individuals probably find um, uh, unenjoyable to the point of offensive. And now they're finally addressing, taking baby steps in the right direction because this is, as this is put, this, the least that they can do right now by making a claim <laughs> that we can stand with you and actually live up to it. I'm also glad that this is being taken seriously because I have since, as long as I can remember being in the gaming space, have said that these kinds of things are wrong, that these shouldn't be stated in usernames, that users shouldn't be able to get away with blatant harassment, blatant racism, blatant sexism. And it only means so much if it's just coming from me, just one person repeating it enough times doesn't really do anything. Um, yeah. I mean, it can, but it's not nearly as impactful as you know all 50 states and really the worldwide community standing up 
against this and, you know, to take steps to be more inclusive and to end racism. Yep. I that, hope to see other games do this as well. That's something that uh, I think since I've played Call of Duty, I've noticed a unfortunate aspect of that community, which is kind of like, uh, instead of self-regulating, uh, more of the trolls seem to find each other and get together and be these types of individuals, more of the, the, the racists that are on the game and playing it. Uh, tend to, to to clump together, and that's something that you'll find. Like you'll see entire teams with racial slurs in their names, and you're just kind of like, literally, not one of you has the ability to understand what it is that you're doing uh, is offensive. It's wrong. It shouldn't even exist. It's just it's kind of like mind numbing sometimes how long it's taken for for this to get addressed and to actually be now like a topic of conversation. Absolutely. Trolls definitely do gang up. It's annoyingly offensive. It also makes people who are standing up for what's right often feel like the minority. I mean, I've been in a lot of League of Legends games where my team or the enemy team will say something really horrible and then other people will jump in. And if anyone speaks out against it, they're called like, oh, like they're, they're called 10 years old and a loser. And, you know, everyone ends up really ganging up on those people that are, you know, standing up for themselves. And because a lot of the reporting for this isn't taken seriously, because some of these words are used as quote unquote gamer words, which I was shocked yeah. when I first heard that term is when like I've, I've heard streamers say, hey, don't use gamer words today. We have some like, you know, co corporates looking at us and it's like, what are gamer words? What do you mean? Yeah. Those are not gamer words. Yeah. That Unless term you're talking should about not leet. apply. Unless you're talking about leet speech. Right, leet uh, speak. Yeah, get out of here. Because gamer words, it's like, no, that, that's, that's not who we are. I mean, this is the other part of, uh, of, of the, the whole conversation of like, in the gaming community, there's, there's over one and a half billion gamers on mm -hmm. the planet. So when you hear people say stuff like that, you're like, no, you don't speak for all of us. This is, no, 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 no. like, calm that down for a little bit there. But then, but then you look at something like now Activision saying, hey, we are going to attack this. And you said something earlier that I agree with is it needs to set a trend going forward. You know, we need to see more major publishers acknowledge if you are saying things or your gamer tag has offensive and racist language inside of it, uh, we are going to give you a temporary ban. And if you continue to do it, we're going to permanently ban you. And that needs to happen. It needs to happen. I hope to see more of that because a lot of this has been dismissed as quote unquote a joke or just trolling or just for fun. But as some people have seen since it started slash some people are just seeing now, these words do have an actual impact. They do lead to, you know, to actions um, that, you know, really promote systemic racism and really make gaming an unsafe space for people of color um, yeah. and for people in general. And, I need to see other game companies do this, please. I am glad that Warzone and Modern Warfare are taking steps to, you know, to to take this off of their platform. I hope to see um, them do a good job because I know a lot of these trolls like to get around the auto sensors by writing variants or adding spaces or numbers to make a lot of these usernames harder to track down. But I hope the reporting system um, is you know, is utilized well, and there's enough staff to actually take action to ban those accounts. Yeah, and thank you, Hit and Fun, for that prop thank there. You, I, do, I do want to just, uh, you know, add one thing real quick, Maddie, to, mm -hmm. to what she just said is, um, when we hide behind our usernames and our gamer IDs, this is the conversation we had about sexual harassment towards women. It's this same example here. If you said stuff like this in public, there would be consequences for the things that you say. Either it might happen from an individual, might happen from your job, but stuff like this should follow you if you are saying these things, because it should not be that an individual can go and say racist slurs, derogatory comments, just speak in a way that they can hide behind their, their anonymity on the internet and then go and get a job in maybe like a public relations thing and, and just hide themselves where so it's horrible. like, no, that's an individual that needs to be taken care of and they should not be in that space because they are truly the individual that they are when they hide behind their gamer tag. I mean, what you just said actually is perfectly set up what I was going to say, which is a one, one thing that like makes me, when I saw this headline of like, finally... Like we 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 like I'm glad this is finally being addressed and we're seeing headlines around this is one really frustrating aspect about 
being in the gaming scene in the gaming community is you see prominent people and i'm, I'm not going to mention this person's name but they were at one point the most subscribed person on youtube ah. saying things and these these words just slipping out of their mouth while they're gaming mm -hmm. which is which means they say it a lot when they're yep. off camera yep. um and th and those consequences not happening for said uh, for said people and that's not just that one person it's happened many times since and it and it becomes like a a story of like every three months there's like another story of like oh yeah someone said a word they got banned from twitch or youtube or whatever and then they get reinstated and you know they're back to normal kind of yeah. a thing i think you're right i think there needs to be a, a line drawn in the sand of like no they can they should not be able to come back um right. from that kind of a thing and maybe something like this will will be a baby step towards that happening but it, you got to start somewhere yeah and i'm a proponent there to add to to what you said as uh, like i'm a proponent of uh you know someone getting the chance to restore themselves and redeem themselves but they mm -hmm. they need to show that they are in fact doing that whether that's community service you know for a a, a non for profit organization that you know is helping people of color or you know things of that nature that whatever they speak that they do say i'm sorry for they sh their their actions follow with it so that if they do b get reinstated because we don't really understand the amount of like of a ripple effect that a popular youtuber like the one you're talking about can actually impact the amount of listeners that they have that it shouldn't just be oh you know here was a slap on your wrist for 6 months and then you come right back and you start possibly doing the same thing again there needs to be some some display of i've learned my lesson and and the community then agrees that they actually have i've also seen a lot of tweets where people are upset that a lot of these companies are taking anti-racism stands they're saying why are you pushing this on my children like this is about games and people of color have been saying well when you're black like you learn about this as a child it's like you have like a lot of white people have the privilege of not having to learn about racism until they're older. But, you know, for a lot of black families and for a lot of black children, that's something you need to learn young because that is what the world around you is like. And so when people talk about children on these platforms, it's like, yes, there are black children on these platforms that have to face racism right off the bat when they're playing games. That shouldn't happen. And these companies should protect them, at least in some way, um, just because someone's young and says a racist statement maybe they're ignorant, maybe they made a mistake, but serious action needs to be taken, whether that's a banned account that maybe they can repeal, but it shouldn't just be quite a small slap on the wrist of like, oh, you didn't know better. It should be, you didn't know better, and now you really know to never make that mistake again. Yeah, and something that hopefully we'll see more developers uh, uh, start to do in line with some of these bigger ones is our, is our next story, continuing this conversation here into the fact that GTA Online and Red Dead Online will temporarily close to honor George Floyd. Rockstar has announced that it will be shutting down GTA Online and Red Dead Online today for two hours to quote, honor the legacy of George Floyd. Both game servers closed between 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Pacific or 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern today. Rockstar followed up its initial, its initial message by asking players to support victims of racial injustice by supporting a list of civil rights-based charitable organizations. Following the memorial, we hope you will join us in further honoring the many victims of America's racial injustices by supporting their families, Black-owned businesses, those marching on the streets, and coalitions through the organizations listed here where they link to a civil rights hub on charitynavigator.org. You know, for me, this, uh, I think, speaks volumes for Rockstar Games. Uh, as we know, this community can be pretty bad, too. What do you feel, what do you think about, you know, the servers shutting down for Memorial for George Floyd? I think it's great that the servers shut down and also redirected people to a list of charitable organizations. I think I've seen some messages from companies or corporations just saying, hey, we stand with Black Lives Matter, but that's kind of the extent of what they do versus, hey, we stand like we stand with Black Lives Matter. This is what we're doing to support the movement, and this is how you can support the movement. I think is a much stronger message, and I think it's overall good because even though shutting down the game server itself doesn't really do much, I think it does bring awareness to maybe people who don't see this situation that seriously, or maybe it's not that close to home for them. Maybe you know they're on the other side of the world or they live in somewhere more rural where this isn't as prominent. I think this is a good way to bring attention to this issue and to show that it is serious and that people should care. 
Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm right there with you hitting fun as many others should. If there's one thing that we can all agree on in data about Rockstar Games is they have been on top with GTA Online. They have a monster of a community. They have a popularity that's stuck for the past seven, eight years now. So when somebody so significant is able to do something like this, it really does, uh, I think, set a precedent for the other game companies that hope to achieve the status of Rockstar Games and, you know, uh, can send a message that is uh, parallel to the one that they're sending here and in the same space uh, that because we are as big as we are and our voice does reach millions, we can be role models, as, as Hidden Fun is saying there. And, and that is by taking action and not just, you know, uh, uh, words, empty words. Exactly. So with gaming being a distraction from real life, oftentimes, where do we think the responsibility is for game companies to spread awareness for civil rights issues? You know, that's something that I would love to see where these gaming companies start to, you know, directly partner with some of these non-for-profit organizations or these, these groups that are working very hard to, uh, you know, end these aspects of humanity that I think we can universally agree on shouldn't exist. I'm, I am a, I'm a huge proponent of, of doing our best to have unconditional love for one another. Mm -hmm. It is not easy to do that. It is a very difficult thing to do. Um, and, and when we go with that mindset into any situation, we can find a way to, to serve justice and also serve up, you know, uh, restoration and, and, and not, you know, uh, capital punishment but more of a, how do you learn from this mistake? How do you, um, how do you grow from this situation? And since we have a, a voice that reaches your ears, um, we need to do more, and this is what we're gonna do. I think that while companies don't have maybe an obligation to spread awareness for these issues, I think that they are all affected with how it um, has an impact on their own studio. For example, I think these companies should really take a look at, hey, what is our diversity in the workplace? Do we have any diversity? Could we improve that? What are we yeah. doing with diversity in our games? What are we doing with the voice lines in our games? With games being a distraction, um, let's say I'm going to play a game and I'm just looking to take you know, a break from my responsibilities and to go into a fantasy world. It's oftentimes happened where I'll play a game and every single character who speaks is a man and then like an accessory to the side is a woman and I'm like, I just wanted to play this game to get away from the patriarchy for five minutes, but it is still being shoved in my face in this way. And it really does distract me from the distraction of the game. And I think it relates to, you know, I, I think a lot of people have similar experiences in different ways. For example, when I look at Fortnite skins, there aren't that many black characters in Fortnite skins. And I could see someone taking a distraction, uh, taking a break from life and to have the distraction of the game, but to see that, hey, this online fantasy world is still not what I would want an online fantasy world yeah. to be because I still see the effects of oppression in this game, even though the developers aren't trying to be racist or trying not to um, amplify black voices. I think a lot of these things often just slip through the cracks because there isn't a lot of diversity or there could be a lot more. Yeah, I think, uh, and I'm, I, I would agree with what, what Hidden Fun's saying there too, that it's not done on purpose. Um, or at least that's a, a good assumption to take on the matter. I think something that we, we talked about a couple of weeks ago is we lifted up the developers from uh, moving out because one of the things they did was they led with inclusive diversity in their character choices and creations. And that was important to them. I think the more we continue to talk about this um, is, is something that will, maybe as Brown Bear says that it's subconsciously done, we'll get rid of that. You know, the more that this is addressed and the more that uh, uh, people going forward say, you know what, we do need to have uh, a skin for every character that represents everyone uh, from all different walks of life. We, we should just naturally be able to do that. So hopefully it'll be something that it, you know, it starts to spread. You know, we start to realize that we need to pay it forward. Uh, and again, there's just so many gamers out there if, if not the gaming community, you know, what else? Like we can, I always felt for me when it came to the gaming community that even though I was someone who suffered a lot of bullying when I was younger, I was accepted. 
I wasn't judged by this preconceived notion of my upbringing or whatever was going on uh, in me as a child. And why can't we do that in all these other places? Like, why does it stop at this one point? It should just be something that we have and we, we spread about to everyone. And our developers and publishers, I would hope, have that same mindset and experience. So what Hinton Fun said and what Brown Bear said are exactly my points that the developers don't do it on purpose, but they still let it happen. I think that like what I'm trying to say is that even if you have great intentions, even if you are a good person and you try to be your best to be nice to people, if your video game characters are all white and majority male speaking, I think that's the point where you'd step back and say, hey, why is it this way? Is there anything I can do to change it? And I think that often in these worlds, in these video game worlds, it unintentionally reflects a lot of the injustices that appear in real life. So my point is that um, yeah. oftentimes developers, you know, try to make it an inclusive place, but unless they're like moving out where they're really taking a look at diversity and saying, hey, how come characters don't really appear in wheelchairs? What can we do about it? I think until developers take that stance and really take a second look at what they're doing, can we see change? Absolutely. And that kind of actually that segues us right into the next story, which is the fact that the Humble Bundle, which is a, a, a group that I think if you've never supported before or bought anything through Humble Bundle, you should, because they have pledged $1 million to help Black game developers. Humble Bundle is a great resource for saving on collections of games and donating to worthy causes, but it's also a publishing label with its own digital storefront. And in support of Black Lives Matter and the ongoing protests in the U.S., Humble Bundle is starting a fund for Black game developers. And the Humble Bundle is starting a fund of $1 million that will help publish games created by Black developers. And details on how the fund will be established and how qualifying developers can apply for it will be communicated in the future with Humble Bundle encouraging its customers to donate to funds like the NAACP, Legal Defense Fund, and Race Forward in the meantime. Humble statement reads, quote, we stand in solidarity to condemn racism and violence against the Black community. Humble believes in empowering and uniting communities through gaming and will leverage our platform to help achieve racial equality everywhere. And Humble Bundle is just one of many game publishers to voice support of racial equality and directly donate to funds aiding affected communities. EA recently announced a donation of $1 million to a variety of funds while also committed to double matching employee donations. Bad Robot Productions, led by Star Wars director J.J. Abrams and his wife, Katie McGrath, have pledged $10 million to charities in the wake of the death of George Floyd. I am very glad to see that Humble Bundle is, you know, supporting this cause, is pledging money to help Black game developers. Humble Bundle has always been seen as a great company, and I'm glad to see that they're really taking steps and putting money where their mouth is. Um, moving forward in the future um, to you know, to rise up, to, to lift up Black voices, there's been a push to put a spotlight on um, people of color, creators and businesses, but it seems difficult to do within gaming because of the lack of diversity on the development side. How do you think we can change this going forward? Like exactly what Humble Bundle is doing. If more of these major publishers like Epic, Electronic Arts, if they were to begin to set aside money, you know, the, the one thing Epic Games is doing is, hey, we're setting aside money for indie developers okay, we'll take a portion of that or add a portion to that. You have billions. Um, mm -hmm. Go ahead and set up a fund that is specifically for uh, black game developers and, and, and help them to be in a position of, you know, hey, I want to do this thing. Uh, I'm not able to do it because I just don't have the access to the funds to be able to do so. Here it is. Apply for this uh, and, and get a chance and an opportunity because I think, uh, the more we see these major publishers who have, I, I don't think we understand how much money a, bil a billion dollars is, but when you when you have that much money and you have the means to make a change, money can actually be the fuel to move the car in that direction. It can. And I know that there are some organizations, especially within certain uh, communities of people of color that are like, um, like Latinas in gaming, for example, or, you know, like black women or, or black people in gaming. And those communities really try to lift each other up. And it would be great to see if some of these developers really form strong relationships with those organizations to make sure that they're, you know, hiring people that are most qualified for the job. And I think a lot of times um, with systemic racism is, uh, for example, you might see two identical resumes, but because one of the names is more um, 
Caucasian or more yeah. white and the other name is more, you know, is more black, uh, the person who's white will be seen as more qualified, even though their credential credentials are exactly the same. So even though I don't think affirmative action is a perfect solution, I think it is the band-aid that we need to get to the next step of having more people of color work at some of these studios and at some of these Second publishers. Time is done. Uh, I think that there is also a wonderful lesson to teach others through the games in which you create. So, you know, for me, I, I think there's something to be said about when you experience a war game that shows war for what it really is and that it, it has the trauma. Yeah, Val, you do. It has the trauma that it does. And anyone who's ever been to war, none of us who have never been to war can ever know what that's like. Uh, it's the same situation for any person of color who's going through a life experience and then someone who doesn't go through that life experience says, oh, I understand what it is that you're going through. And that's just not true. So one of the best things that maybe some of these major gaming companies could do is start to develop games that talk about these things and that address these issues and that you go through the journey of what it's like to be a character going through something like this and gamify it into whatever experience that it can be so that when the, the, the player, you know, puts the controller down, they have that moment to reflect and be impacted it by it just like they would with the war game or, you know, with something like Hellblade, Send You a Sacrifice, that's the mental health uh, uh, game. Definitely. And I am always wondering, why isn't it in companies' best interest to appeal to the widest audience? Like, shouldn't you want to appeal to everyone? Shouldn't you want to people of, of all races to play your game? Um, it seems like a lot of games are unintentionally marketed towards a certain demographic. And sometimes I don't really understand why. I'm kind of like, why, why wouldn't you want more people to play this game? Why wouldn't you want to be more inclusive? Doesn't that relate to how much money you're going to make off of this game? Yeah, I think this is where we, we still have to, you know, we still have to take into account that uh, the the gaming industry is is in entertainment uh, business, which is show business. And there's just sometimes the distraction of business and pie charts and numbers uh, that you don't maybe you maybe maybe it is a subconscious reaction that we were talking about before, where you don't see the 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 the, the destruction you're causing or the continuation of a problem you're causing because you are just so focused on, well, I'm looking for this age group uh, and, and here in this demographic because it'll make us the most amount of money. And that just isn't helping anything other than yourself, the publisher, the developer. And then it becomes very chicken and egg because when we hear that there's a lot of uh, like stereotypically teenage boys in gaming, well then these companies will market to the teenage boys, which means more teenage boys will be in gaming, which means they'll market to the teenage boys. And then it's just kind of a cycle that it seems like they're locked into and it becomes really hard to break that, especially when that's been the stereotype of what the average gamer is for years. Yeah, and that's why we need these bigger companies to, to address these things and talk about these things and, and do something different. You know, it's great to see Humble Bundle putting up its money to do this. I'd love to see these other big game companies and publishers like, like Rockstar Games maybe start to put aside money and do this same thing. Set an example, you know, uh, for me, Ron and I, we talk about this all the time is like, be the change you actually wish to, wish to see in the world. And that requires you to do it. You have to do it. And at conventions, I've seen that there will be a panel of speakers and the only black speakers are those speaking at a diversity panel. But the whole point is that every panel should have diversity in yes. it, at least some diversity. Don't just put the black speakers in the diversity panel. Like, yeah. don't some of these people see the problem? I feel like it's right in front of them and they're almost there. It's just these companies have to take that next step to really see, hey, to really support diversity, we should have diversity in everything that we do. What's up, Serial? What's up, DX? Yeah, it, yeah, it, and Mick, that's it. That's exactly it. Good intentions, but poor execution. Exactly. Uh, this is this is where uh, we need to be willing to self, you know, course correct. We need to be willing to self-examine, even as these major these major entities and and these major companies. You know, they might on paper be recognized as individuals, but they're not. And so it should be the consumers and it should be the, the, the workers underneath them driving that ship, steering it the right direction. And everybody at the top is listening to what the masses want and not uh, only what, you know, dollars and pie charts say will be the best 
for the the top of 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 the company's paychecks and pockets. Precisely. I think that good intentions but poor execution is is the theme of of a lot of things that I see in gaming. I am glad that there are at least baby steps being taken. I'm glad that we at least have panels on diversity that we at least have efforts to take racism, you know, out of video games and usernames and that we're seeing more money going towards supporting people of color in the video game industry. I hope that this is kickstarting a further change and a further trend that we're going to see even more of this and this isn't just you know a, a short-term solution for now i hope that this leads to long-term change in the future of gaming yeah uh and and funny i've been running this matrix background because it feels like living in the matrix right now. <laughs> it feels like you're just like can we just unplug from this because this hey, what yeah. is happening right now what this is, is happening? this does not what um but our next story is that epic has delayed Fortnite's the device event and the new season again. So for all you Fortnite players out there, be aware that this is happening. Thank you so much, Serial, for the Thank prop. Thank you, Serial. So to probably no one's surprise, Epic Games has announced another delay for Fortnite's The Device event and the beginning of Chapter 2, Season 3. The event, which is a catalyst for the new season, was due to take place on June 6th. Epic has now pushed the device to Monday, June 15th, and the start of Season 3 to June 17th. And this is what they said. Recent events are a heavy reminder of ongoing injustices in society, from the denial of basic human rights to the impact of racism, both overt and subtle, against people of color. They went on to say, we are ac acutely aware of the pain of our friends, families, team members, players, and communities are experiencing. Thank you and so much, Serial, for all your props to charity. So multiple gaming-related events and reveals concluding the upcoming Cyberpunk 2077 stream have been postponed this week due to the growing unrest around the U.S. and the world in light of the murder of George Floyd at the hands of police on May 25th. And we're going to continue to update you all on a lot of these highly anticipated summer events. I know someone earlier was asking about the PlayStation 5 reveal, which was set for this week but also got delayed. But I think all of us can agree that we are happy to wait as our country and the whole world has bigger issues to deal with at the moment. I am very glad to hear that these companies are taking it seriously because of all the unrest in on social media and in the world. This is not the time to celebrate a new Fortnite season. And I think that going back to when we were talking about, well, what is the responsibility of game companies, you know, when it comes to civil rights movements and when it comes to activism, I think that this is also um, part of their responsibility. I, I think it's, it's great that Fortnite is delaying this. They are not trying to take any attention away from what's going on and they want to take a step back to let the movement shine and for people to, to, um, to amplify the voices of people yep. that need to be heard right now, I think is a great move. Yep, that's exactly right. Silence doesn't mean not saying anything. You can still amplify others. It means stop focusing on self or what you are happening in your life and help the voices that are unheard and the ones that need amplification. So, yeah. Oh, and yeah, hitting fun to your uh, to to your question. Yeah, all the all the props that go to the caffeine channel do, in fact, yeah, we we put those towards charities. They don't go towards us, the the streamers. So uh, that is just something to know. So thank you very much for your prop as well as cereal. Thank you so much. Our next story of today is Karma retires from professional Call of Duty. So Damon Karma Barlow uh, retired from professional Call of Duty on Wednesday. He is widely regarded as the greatest Call of Duty player of all time and is the only player to have won three Call of Duty championships, two of which came back to back, 2013, 2014, and 2017. Casil, hit and fun. Thank you again for more. Thank you of so much. Props. Karma wrote a Twitter statement released by his most recent team, the Seattle Surge. Quote, I would like to thank everyone that helped me on my journey. First and foremost to my wife, Holly, and my daughter, Bella, who motivate and inspire me every day. So to, he goes on to say, to my teammates throughout the years, including my teammates on the Seattle Surge, to all the fans that have followed me throughout my entire career, through my three championship seasons through to today, with those in the city of Seattle, I'd like to say thank you for your support as I enter into the next chapter of my life. I wish the best to the Surge organization and to thank them for their understanding and guidance through this tough decision. 
He continued on his personal account to say, I think this was something I needed to do a while ago. Game wasn't really catered to me. In his tweets, Karma added that playing Modern Warfare wasn't fun for him. He had zero desire to play the game and that he thinks Seattle will perform better without him. He also said that he won't be back because new Call of Duty games are only fun for about a month before he grows tired of playing, which is longer than Shroud, who only likes them for two weeks. Yeah, and Karma began playing competitive Call of Duty in 2010 when he was 17. He retires with 24 major championship wins during his tenure on multiple organizations, most famously Evil Geniuses and Optic Gaming, long before the Call of Duty League was formed this year. Karma earned the nickname Three Rings due to his three titles. Currently, the Seattle Surge are ranked 11th out of 12 total teams in the Call of Duty League with 40 total league points. It's interesting that for how great Karma has been in Call of Duty for almost a decade, he has decided to retire at such a young age, at the age of 26. Do we think this will continue to be the case with esports pros retiring young as esports evolves? I think the phrase retiring young is an odd one to hear. Uh, But I will say, even for myself, with a game like Rocket League, which I, I was... It's the game I used to play all the time. And it just got to a point where it, it wasn't fun to me anymore. It got to the point where I would play and it felt more of like a headache. I, I, I knew the game and I knew the mechanics, but I was just like, yeah, I don't enjoy this. And I couldn't imagine being a pro in that situation where you're like, well, this is my livelihood. It's how I pay the bills. I mean, I'm, 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 I make my, my notoriety from this and I don't want any more. Me, the casual, you know, gamer from home I can just walk away to another game but some of these people it's their entire identity absolutely and a lot of pros I I feel that um, there's a lot of burnout that happens in esports like crispy just said yeah absolutely like crispy just said they get very burned out I was recently talking to uh I I believe a semi-pro league of legends player and they were like yeah I'm one of the best uh volley bears in the world but I don't really like the game but it's what I'm good at so I guess I should do that and I think that's a big sentiment along uh, among a lot of pro gamers is that this is the best thing that they're good at but they don't really like the game anymore they don't really want to play the game anymore so I think that contributes to why so many pros retire young I hope that we see something like Tom Brady in the future where he's 44, 45 right now, and he's still playing football. Yeah. I hope to see more pro players, if they really do like the game, um, have a long career in playing versus having to retire, quote unquote, retire so early and move on to something else. Yeah. As someone who played 10 years of a traditional sport, such as uh, American football, the one thing that I'll say that's different in esports than traditional sports is there's kind of this journey in traditional sports, at least from my own experience and what I can say from the outside looking into the esports life is there's this development of maturation that happens um, before you get thrust into the spotlight and you're taking these you yes. know, big responsibilities on. And I don't really see that we have that within esports, that we don't have the the system that slowly works your way up and educates you. So then after, you know, several years of doing this thing that you love to do and you've got all the tools around you to hopefully do the best that you can then when you step into the pro spotlight you can hopefully apply those tools to have a successful long career because you know some of this just makes sense to me from just a a basic level of like yeah i just don't think they're 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 developing properly and and are having this burnout so early that's true i think a lot of these pros aren't set up for a long-term career I'm just thinking now about how Karma is 26, he has a wife, he has a child, and he started playing when he was 17 or 18. So I'm imagining, let's say I have, you know, I have a spouse and a child, and let's say I'm playing next to a 17-year-old that's still maybe in high school. I feel like that is such a difference of culture or, you know, a difference of, of where we would be in life. And I imagine that that kind of clash or or just just difference in world of you probably also contributes to some of these pros thinking that they're too old to really want to be in this scene. Right. Yeah, that's that oh, I that, that would be so <laughs> disappointing if that becomes the trend if they're like, "Yeah, you're over the age of 21, you can't be a pro in esports." You'd be like, "What? You're not cool what's, anymore." What's happening? Yeah, you've got that's like the model thing. You know how like models are always they work between these specific ages right? and then and they then don't really done. work anymore. Yeah. Oh, please esports don't do that. 
please, please don't do this please esports. Don't become that. Yeah. I, I think with what you said of, of having there be more preparation for becoming a pro or, you know, having more development to make sure that the people who do become pro, you know, are really ready for that and are ready for being in the spotlight would definitely help. I think a lot of it also comes with some ageism I could see of like, oh, yeah. like, aren't you kind of old to be playing video games now? Like, what exactly right. are you doing? And I'm, I'm, if I were older and working in that scene, I would feel very out of place. And I would think that maybe it's not for me anymore. So I hope to see as a lot of gamers do become older, that we also see a shift that, you know, these teams are being managed by people who are older, they're being coached, they're more older players, and it becomes okay to be an older player, you know, besides the fact for maybe some of these pros just aren't having fun in these games anymore. Yeah, Casillo, I put it down. I put the, ga I put the game down. I'll play it casually, <laughs> but, I, but I'm no longer pushing that Rocket League competitive uh, life anymore. Uh, I was going to say one, because I, I was I was on Twitter when this news broke, and it definitely sent ripples along around, because I follow a lot of people within the Call of Duty uh, CDL Pro uh, world, and I think one thing that was like, one big takeaway for me is like, one, I think people were shocked because he's just been around since Call of Duty Pro has been a thing, like he's just been right. one of the, so it's like, it's like he's one of those figures that now he's going to be gone, it's like, well, you, you have these like names that are just not, like, notorious, like if, once LeBron James retires it'll be like well oh, everyone yeah. thinks of nba they think of lebron james same thing mm -hmm. we had the, we just had the last dance with michael jordan for a lot for a lot of people michael jordan was the nba right yep. but um one I, one thing i think uh listening to your guys conversation that i was thinking too is like uh the 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 games need to start kind of shifting to a point where they 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 iterate so much and especially a game like call of duty which has a yearly calendar release i can see i'm actually it's almost surprising you can look at it a different way and, and it's surprising that people don't retire even earlier because of the, how much the game changes year to year for how much you have to change as a player to going from yeah. like infinity warfare which is like not too long yeah. ago like five years ago where it's literally boots off the ground you have jet packs and you're flying around the map yeah to Two years later, it's back to World War II, and you have Car 98 guns and and and, and like very like you know what I mean like yeah. And so and I think once we have what we hope is like Valorant, this game that like almost starts this baseline of like hyper competitive, <laughs> like uh, uh, um, thinking about the future from the get go, not uh, as a yearly calendar release. Maybe that's how we'll get these pros lasting longer because then it becomes more yeah. like Marone saying a culture of like starting young and developing your skill set. And then eventually having a career that we all see with traditional uh, pros in like basketball or, or football, you start in college or you start in Pop Warner, high school, college, pro. Like we don't really have that path for esports yeah. pros right now. Yeah, that was something uh, Crispy had had commented on that the the constant games changing and mechanics changing it becomes frustrating. You're like, wait, I've just put in, you know, all these hours of playing of my life this one way. And then they're like, well, here's a new one. And you got to be playing and you got to be on top and you got to be the same best version of yourself that you were the past game. And you're like, that's just too much mental pressure. I'm just, I was just getting to the top on that one. And then it's like, and now you're back down. It's yeah, there, there needs to be this just foundation. Like we see with something in Valorant, as Maddie was saying, and other games to come out after them, that there's just the foundation that we are like, this is the core game. This is the experience that it'll be. And we'll slowly add things in and we'll allow the journey to play out so that you can evolve uh, to, your, to your fullest and not constantly feel like you're being basically, you're blossoming and being uprooted to be planted again to then blossom to be uprooted to be planted again. Exactly. A lot of these games switch it up to try to keep it exciting for maybe more of the casual players, but for the pros, that changes the entirety of how they play the game, what they do, and, you know, the, their, the strategies that they take. I also wanted to speak on Phoenix comment that says, in real sports, your traditional sports, but, quote, in real sports, your body makes you stop, in esports, your butt gets numb. Hard <laughs> disagree with your comment. Hard disagree. In esports, there are a lot of instances of carpal tunnel, of people's wrists, totally giving out or being in constant pain. Um, also the effects of sitting all day. There are a lot of studies with people in offices, how that takes years off your life because it is so harmful to your body. I think that a lot of esports really ignores that and they don't realize that like, hey, everyone needs to take wrist stretches. Everyone needs to take a break from being on their keyboard. Maybe we have to modify keyboards so it's not so much strain. Maybe we have to mandate that everyone works out in the middle of the day because sitting for 12 hours is really hard on your body. And I'm sure that has an effect on your motivation, on your quote unquote mental, as people say in gaming and how you ultimately play the game. 
Yeah, I did make this comment to my brother who's a personal trainer. He has his own gym. I was like, you know, all these big gaming organizations that are getting their own facilities, they should hire PTs to come in and handle training their players and get them to come in and, you know, train at different times to offset the damage that they're doing, which is what you're addressing right there. Uh, because that is that is necessary. And there is some science to show that you'll actually be better at the game that you play if you work out prior to it because the, th the chemicals that dump inside your brain and what happens inside of your body will actually assist you in better hand-eye coordination, uh, better critical thinking. There's just all these things that come with it that I would say, listen, esports in general needs to uh, include these things as, a, as, as, like you said, mandatory. They do. Phoenix says no disrespect men. No disrespect taken. I just wanted to state that because a lot of people might see what you said and take that as a fact or really maybe not understand um, the physical toll that gaming and esports can take on the body. I just wanted to say to your point, Maroon, and to, to you guys as well, uh, uh, the, uh, one of the best pros right now in Call of Duty, Arcides, he was last year's champion with United. He, sa he said recently he's lost like 50 pounds uh, over the course wow. of the season and he's having the best season he's ever had. He's like top three players in the league right now. And so, Incredible. so that shows like, and he says uh, that's a testament to the, not just, and he's playing less, he's playing less games. He says he's playing a third amount of Call of Duty that he did last year, but wow. spending the rest of the time working out uh, and, and working on his mental and physical health alongside with his twin brother, Pristini too. And so that's why they're awesome. so good right now. So that's great. Great to see you. Our next topic for today is that Destiny 2 reveal is coming June 9th. Watch the new teaser. So this will be the first official look at Destiny's two, Destiny 2's next content season, season 11. Here it is. Let's check it out. That's it. That was quite and a sweet. teaser, wasn't That's it? it? There wasn't much revealed. No, that was the Drifter uh, flying that ship. He's one of the characters that, uh, he is the character that handles Gambit, which is this uh, mode inside of Destiny 2. So the developer there, Bungie, shared a teaser trailer on Twitter that gives us some new hints about where maybe Destiny 2's story is headed, and while also confirming that a reveal live stream will take place next week. The reveal is set for 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern on June 9th, although we don't know yet what it'll cover. The timing is significant, <laughs> though. Destiny 2's next content season kicks off on the same day at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. That is next Tuesday. And we've got almost no details about what is set to happen in it outside of some changes to gear systems Bungie has talked about in past blog posts. Well done, Softy. Well done. I love that very much. That was, <laughs> Thank you that was, so much. That was a great use of that. Uh, so Bungie has also suggested that the reveal could go beyond talking about season 11 to discuss bigger things on the horizon, namely the start of Destiny 2's fourth year. Destiny typically gets big expansions in the fall, as it did with the Shadowkeep expansion in 2019, and we're quickly approaching the start of year four this fall, so the reveal might cover the next major addition to Destiny 2, as well as the smaller content offerings that come with a typical season. The teaser itself also includes some interesting hints at the future. It features the Drifter, the character that runs Destiny 2's Gambit activity, taking a ship toward what looks to be Jupiter's moon of Europa. If you didn't get that from the seemingly one second of teaser trailer that we have. That's a place many players have believed would soon become a new in-game location, and the new teaser adds some credence to that theory. So <sighs> Marone, as our resident ex-Destiny grinder, our former grinder, what would you like to see from Destiny 2 Season 11, and will you be playing Destiny 2? Yeah. Uh, no, Casil, I have not played it since the most recent update that I just found to be a reskin of the previous uh, Season of the Dawn. Um, I think they, they got to do a lot, honestly. I feel like Destiny 2 is so far behind other uh games and it hasn't truly embraced the mmo aspect that it could uh you know the whole conversation always in the beginning what was with destiny was i know because a lot's changed uh was that it's this um you know diablo shooter type and i never truly felt like that was actually there and i think they do continue to be like hey we're, we're you know we're trying to add this stuff to the game to make it uh more fun but I just felt 
like when I have the same experience over and over and over again, I'm like, I'm running the same strike. I'm running the same mission, run here and grab this thing, deliver it to that thing. Like the variety is just not there, but then they do these like morsels of something really fun, like the infinite forest uh, or the haunted forest, where it's just basically a procedurally generated uh, uh, encounter. And then they only do it for a temporary amount of time. And it's like, no, no, that's a, that's a fresh experience all the time. Keep it. Why would you just let it go away like that? Do you think that this new announcement is just probably going to be more of reskinned missions? I hope it's not. And my my gut is saying yes, because I don't, I, I haven't seen Bungie do, I think the last thing that they did that I really enjoyed was the expansion with Spider, where you were like basically bounty hunting these people who killed a very popular character in the series. And that there was just so much at stake in that journey and in that experience that it was a lot of fun. Uh, but then right afterwards, it kind of like shifted back to the same thing. And part of me was just like, why wouldn't you, you know, capitalize on that difference that wasn't, you know, there prior. You saw a, a, a surge of players. The first time they haunted the, uh, dropped the Haunted Forest, there was a lot of people interested in that and continuing to see that. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know what they're doing. I'll, I'll watch it and I'll, I might be interested to jump into it deeper, but I, I'm, I'm just, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of disappointed. That's so disappointing to hear. Thank you so much, Softy. So, Thank you, Softy. On a side note, it's called Destiny 2, but it seems like it's very ongoing. There's a lot of expansions. Yeah. There's a lot of new things in it. Do people still play Destiny 1? And do you think Destiny 2 should just be called Destiny? I think that would be a good step in the right direction. Yeah, people do still play Destiny 1. I believe the D D1 servers are still live. I think there there is something to be said about it, just calling itself Destiny. Uh, and that being the game going forward that could uh, could help remove that confusion. Um, I, I just would, for me, I think one of the places that Destiny hasn't really found itself as is a competitive shooter. I think it's more of like this experience that is, you know, kind of solely a PvE, somewhat PvP, you know, friends getting on and kind of like having like an arcade experience with a shooter. But I think they could get really deep in competitive gaming and I, I would love for them to introduce like pve competitions that are actual instances happening where you might see the other team's score happening alongside your score and you guys are you guys are racing through this you know procedurally generated encounter uh and you know that's something that 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 is on on the line or just something different otherwise it really does just feel like the same game all the time that would be super cool to see. Destiny 2 developers, I hope you are listening because the friends that I know that used to play a lot of Destiny 2, they stopped playing it because the raids just felt like the same thing over and over again. As you said, it was a fun experience for them where they would just hop on with their friends, but when their friends weren't online, they wouldn't play it because there wasn't really, you know, the next step to go to in Destiny 2. Thank you, Hit and Fun. Uh, we like to believe that you all are awesome. And the only reason that we are awesome is because you are awesome. So thank you very much for that. We very much appreciate it. Our last topic of today <laughs> is an, the Outer Worlds graphics comparison between the Nintendo Switch versus a high-end PC. So the award-winning Obsidian RPG, if you haven't played it, you should. The Outer Worlds drops tomorrow on Nintendo Switch. Miraculous ports of the game like The Witcher 3 and Skyrim have made it clear that the Switch can handle large open world games, so long as folks are okay with a loss of resolution. The Outer Worlds arrives on Switch just six months after its premiere on PC, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One. And how well does it withstand the jump to Nintendo's graphically underpowered quasi handheld? So we're showing this footage on the screen. Chat, we would love to hear your opinions on if you think the Nintendo Switch footage looks good, if you think it looks bad. What do you think? What is your impression? The Nintendo Switch port of the Outer Worlds contains all of the content and voice acting of the original release, but some trade-offs had to be made to get the game to run on the hardware. The game is locked to 720p when played in portable mode, but the resolution increases to 1080p while docked. The most obvious change from the existing versions of the game in both cases is an enormous drop in texture quality. Yeah, and the Nintendo Switch port of the Outer Worlds contains all of the content and voice acting of the original release, 
but some trade-offs had to be made to get the game to run on the hardware. The game is locked at 720p when played in portable mode, and the resolution increases to 1080p when docked. The most obvious change from existing versions of the game in both cases is an enormous drop in texture quality. Kotaku went as far as to say that the port looks terrible, but let's have a look for ourselves. We're going to continue watching and reacting to IGN's PC versus Switch Outer Worlds comparison. Chat says it's not that bad and it looks fine to them. What do you think, yeah. Barone? For me, this is a recognize, recognizing the Switch as a hardware is limited in being able to produce what we might be, you know, generally more used to on a console and PC. This feels like a last gen console. Like I would say, I feel like I'm looking at like a Fallout New Vegas, uh, just reskinned. Um, and I use that game specifically because of Obsidian. So <laughs> I would say it's still cool that a handheld game is allowing you to get the full experience of the Outer Worlds. When I first saw this video, I thought that the PC and Nintendo Switch sides were switched, or I couldn't tell. I was like, is this the same footage mirrored? Is this actually different? And I think that the Nintendo Switch actually does a great job of having the world there. I feel like the main elements are there. But once I do start to look closer, it seems like the Nintendo Switch game, it just looks a lot older to me. It looks like a game from maybe 2012. Uh, a lot of details go missing. Pretty much a lot of mainly a lot of plants have disappeared, which makes the environment look a lot more barren versus, you know, overgrown, post-apocalyptic kind of. Yeah. Um, so I think that it's great that this game can be ported to a handheld, but I also feel like it doesn't have as much integrity as other ports have had. Yeah. I believe there is uh, a reasonable understanding that the more we play graphically beautiful games, the more we become accustomed to them. And when we play older games that don't match those graphics, we have uh, uh, an instinctual reaction to resist them or reject them um, because we're just so used to that. And as we step into the next gen consoles with RTX uh, and you know global illumination, ray tracing, we're, we're gonna get even worse about that. So I do hope that a hardware upgrade happens for the Switch. Um, I think that would be uh, wonderful. But, you know, still, again, for a portable experience to get the entire game, I think you just accept it for what it is, knowing that that's not why you're playing the game uh, on the Switch specifically. That's true. When I play a game on the Switch, I'm not going to be really nitpicky about the graphics, um, even though especially in that last shot showing that blue pillar, I thought that was the most stark difference of the PC and Nintendo Switch graphics, especially with a game with a story this rich. I'm playing it for the story and for the experience, not necessarily to have the graphics as impressive, but I could see in some shots how it might take you out of the game a little bit to see that it's not quite the experience that you want on a PC. But then again, you're not playing it on a PC. Exactly. So, but that's cool though. I mean, Kotaku did get really harsh on it and everyone in the chat seems to be like, hey, it's really not that bad. And <laughs> honestly, like for us, we look at the Switch for what it is and it's not as bad as Kotaku made it out to seem. Yeah, I agree. But that brings us to the end of our news for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. If you would like to sign up, you can join the conversation and click the star to get a notification for when we go live. But don't go anywhere because we have some gameplay coming up with Zand, which I believe he's playing more Valorant, trying to get better at a competitive shooter such as Valorant. Everyone that is in the chat with us, thank you so much for, for all of the props, uh, for just being amazing human beings and, and adding so many layers uh, to this experience as we cover the news in, in the gaming industry. Just want to say we appreciate you all very much for being here. Thank you so much for your support. Stay safe, everyone. Have so much fun with Zand. I am Kaisa. I am Roan. We will see you all tomorrow and enjoy the gameplay, the Valorant gameplay. Bye, everybody. Bye.